thank you very much, uh, Peter, and good evening to all of you. And can I say how pleased I am to be back in Canberra? It's um, nicer visiting Canberra these days than living in Canberra. Uh, good to see so many familiar faces. Uh, and Peter, can I acknowledge the work that ASPE does uh, across this whole field of defence, strategic, and foreign policy? So you'll be pleased to know that my remarks won't be as long as my report. Uh, I really just want to give you a, a sense of uh, the line that's taken in the report and the, the conceptual framework that sits behind it. Um, when the PM, or the then PM, commissioned this report uh, last year, I think there were two drivers for it. Uh, one was consciousness raising uh, about India, particularly in the Australian business community. Uh, and the other, as you would expect, with a uh, document that looks forward 20 years, is uh, strategic positioning, how best to position Australia in an Indian market, which is developing very rapidly, attracting a lot of international attention, uh, and where there is a risk that <coughs> Australia starts beginning to fall back. Um, I think the consciousness raising objective actually is sorely needed because when I was uh, traveling around the country talking to the business community and to others, uh, I think there is quite a dated view of India and Australia. Uh, I think um, there's a once bitten, twice shy quality to approaching the Indian business relationship, and not least because there are a number of people senior in the Australian corporate sector who have been once bitten uh, and don't really want to uh, return to the experience. I think there's an understanding of India as a back office, uh, but there isn't much of an understanding of India as a research and development centre. Um, and so part of this report, which is essentially pitched to an Australian audience, uh, is to provide a bit of a narrative about what's happening in India and what it means for uh, Australia. Uh, now, I've focused on three reasons why India matters at this juncture uh, in our history. Uh, the first is simply the scale of India. Uh, it's already by purchasing power parity measures the third largest economy in the world. It's the fastest growing large economy in the world. And I've taken a re relatively moderate view of its rate of growth over the next 20 years and pitched it at between 6 to 8 percent. So if you take what is arguably already the, the third largest economy in the world and fast forward 20 years on the basis of 6 to 8 percent growth, you're dealing with something pretty significant not just for India, but for India's partners and over time for the region and, uh, and more broadly. Uh, and I think the thing about India's economic story is that it's structurally driven and therefore much more likely to be sustainable. Um, it's driven firstly by the urbanization of the world's largest rural population. Uh, secondly, by a, transi a transitioning economy from the informal sector, where 90% of uh, Indians are employed, to the formal sector, um, by a demography which, by global standards, is very young, a mean age of 27, um, an infrastructure investment which is now finally beginning to gain traction, because infrastructure has always been one of the very big barriers to Indian economic growth. Uh, and importantly, uh, for its demography, an upskilling agenda, which is looking to upskill some 400 million people uh, between now and 2022. And that's particularly important, I think, for Australia. So scale is one reason for thinking about India. The second is the complementarity between a growing Indian economy and Australia's capacity as a supplier because the story of Indian growth is going to be um, demand and supply are not going to be in balance. Uh, India is going to have demand which it cannot meet 
domestically, even though its instinct is to try and meet everything domestically. And Australia is in a position to help bridge the gap between uh, supply and demand. Um, and the third reason, beyond scale and complementarity, is just managing risk for Australia. Um, we're entering into a very volatile period in our international relations, which is not just a geopolitically volatile region, but also a region where the economic outlook is going to look more certain. 40% uh, of our exports currently go to two markets, and they're both aging markets. Um, it just strengthens Australia's economic resilience if we are able to spread our risk across a larger uh, number of markets, and I think India fits into that category. So in, in, in writing this report, we've tried to navigate between the view that India is the next China, and the Modi government has sorted out every problem India faces, uh, and the view that India is just too hard and will always remain in the too hard basket. Uh, India is not the next China, and it only distracts us from understanding India to think about it as the next China. Uh, it has a very different system. Its economic model is going to be very different. This will not be the East Asian model. This will be a model driven much more earlier by consumption and not the East Asian export model. Uh, China is five times the size of the Indian economy. So the Chinese economy would virtually have to collapse and India grow at well over 10% a year for a sustained period for India to become uh, the next China. Um, but that said, uh, I think it's important that you take a long-term view of the way in which the Indian economy is developing because Change in India is often invisible to the naked eye. Uh, this is not like visiting China where every 12 months you will see, you know, the physical evidence of rapid change. But if you say, benchmark the Indian economy circa 1990 when the economic reform program began and the Indian economy today. So most people in Australia think of India as a closed economy essentially a closed economy. The trade to GDP ratio of India today is almost exactly to the decimal point the same as the trade to GDP ratio of Australia. And we think of ourselves rightly, in my view, as a relatively open economy. And similarly, you can look at tariff levels, which in 1990 were probably about a tenth of where they are uh, today. Um, so this is a story of incremental change and incremental growth that has a very significant aggregate effect. Um, and what I've tried to do with the, with the report is to give our business community something that they can touch and feel rather than just the macro story about big country, big opportunities, you know, go there. Uh, it's not the intention of the report that all Australian businesses rush off to India. I think that would be sheer madness if that <coughs> happened. Uh, but any Australian business that is actively engaged in the international market or actively thinking about export opportunities should at the very least ask themselves the question, can we afford not to be in the Indian market? And the answer may well be, the fit is not for us, uh, but I think the question needs, needs to be asked uh, and asked sooner across our business community. Now, I've um, described the future of the relationship as resting on three pillars. One is the economic complementarity that I've spoken about. The second is our geopolitical congruence, which I believe is going to get closer. Uh, and the third is uh, a rapidly growing people-to-people -people dimension, essentially driven by uh, the growth in the Indian diaspora in Australia. Um, now, the, the, the geopolitical congruence uh, flows from a number of things. 
And it partly flows from the fact that India itself is reconceptualizing and repositioning its strategic policy away from the rhetorical and moralistic appeal of the non-aligned movement and much more towards uh, a more hard-headed analysis of its national interests. And as India recalibrates its own position, it is naturally going to find more common ground with the likes of the United States and Japan uh, and Australia. Um, part of the strategic congruence is driven by a broadly similar attitude to a rules-based international order. It's by no means an identical attitude between our two countries. Uh, and certainly, uh, India is not interested in observing rules that they had no part in making. Uh, and nor is India much impressed by the concept of American exceptionalism. But for the most part, India is a supporter of the rules-based system. And that matters for a country like Australia, because we can't buy or bully our way in the world. Uh, and uh, the defenders of the rules-based system are declining, and its opponents are increasing. Um, so to have a, a broadly like-minded country on that is very important. Um, and thirdly, India is in that category of countries, which is probably most of us, uh, that want to see regional institutions in uh, what we now call the Indo-Pacific uh, greatly strengthened. So when it comes to the East Asia Summit or other organizations like that, we both have, uh, at least in terms of aspiration, a wish to see uh, stronger regional institutions uh, and, more, and in, inclusive regional institutions. Um, but there is also, I think, a deeper thread that runs through the Australia-India strategic relationship, and that is how we all deal with uh, a shifting regional strategic outlook where the margin of US strategic predominance is declining, and where the ambition of China to become the predominant power in the region uh, is becoming more clearly and confidently articulated and asserted. Um, my own view is that over time, uh, we will have to find a new strategic equilibrium to deal with that challenge. Uh, I don't think unlike some say in the United States, that you can stop China from its economic growth and development and consequent strategic weight. But I think we're all going to have to learn how to manage that situation. And ultimately, managing that situation will require uh, an organic balancing of China. Uh, and when you start thinking about how an organic balancing of China will be constructed and who are going to be the key players in that, uh, then I think it's countries like the United States, Japan, India, and Australia, which will probably be at the core of it, which is why groups like the Quad, which admittedly at the moment is very incipient, uh, are potentially quite significant groupings because they form, if you like, the core of what is likely to evolve uh, into a much more sophisticated uh, strategic equilibrium. And so I think you cannot think about the Australia-India strategic relationship absent what's happening more broadly in the region and particularly absent what's happening more broadly vis-a-vis uh, India and China. So that doesn't mean that Australia and India have an identical view to China, because we don't. Uh, India's view of China is the view of inspiring great power. It's the view of a neighbor of China. It's the view of a neighbor that has had a contested border and has gone to war with China. Now, virtually none of those drive Australia's thinking on China. Um, and so we need to be, I think, fairly hard-headed in understanding what brings us together, but also recognizing what will continue to separate us, even though we may end up in 
the same bed with very different dreams. Um, so that's the geopolitics of it. And I think, I think the whole development of the Indo-Pacific concept, uh, at least from an Australian perspective or from the perspective of this Australian, is trying to find a way to accommodate India into the strategic matrix of Asia. Now, it comes as quite a surprise for the Indians that they were not part of the strategic matrix of Asia. But the reality is, when we thought about our strategic circumstances, we thought about it in terms of an Asia-Pacific framework, uh, which did not include India, because there was no reason to include India over that period of time. But as India's economic interests pull it more towards East Asia, and as India's strategic horizons move well beyond its own neighborhood, which, is, which has been its primary strategic uh, preoccupation, uh, I think the idea of an, of an Asia-Pacific, which is stretched to include India and becomes an Indo-Pacific strategic system will, will make uh, more and more sense. So as to the third pillar, which is the uh, Indian diaspora, um, this, is, this is a development that's really quite recent, uh, and it's really a phenomenon since 2006, because from 2006 to now, we've seen an extraordinarily rapid increase uh, in the size of the Indian diaspora off the back of uh, a surge in skilled migration, with India now being uh, our top source country for skilled migrants. Uh, a student uh, movement which is driven by a migration outcome. India is now our second largest source uh, of uh, international students. And unlike our largest source of international students from China, most Indians who come to study in Australia do so with the intention or at least the hope of staying in Australia, whereas the proportion of Chinese students coming to Australia now returning to China are in around about 80% or so, so it's a, it's a different it's a different profile. Uh, and then we've had now a very large number of skilled Indian professionals coming in under the old 457 visa system. And again, uh, resident in Australia temporarily, but many of them likely to uh, transition into a migration pathway. So a diaspora of 700,000, which is probably the fastest growing diaspora. If you fast forward at 20 years, it'll probably be about 1.4, 1.5 million. It starts becoming quite a significant um, uh, influence on the relationship. And it's important that Australia thinks about these diaspora communities as an Australian asset uh, and not as an asset to be deployed uh, by others. Um, because both India and China are countries that spend an awful amount of attention, time and attention, on their diaspora communities and the way in which the diaspora communities can reinforce their national interests. Now, in many ways, this is not a zero-sum game, uh, but I don't think, as a, as, a, as a country, we think enough about how we shape and position diasporas in our own country to be a national asset. And so I think uh, this diaspora will over time become a very important gateway in the relationship, including as an interpreter of business culture and the business environment, and creating those connections across societies and in the arts and all the other nooks and crannies of a relationship uh, that can really add texture and strength to, uh, to a bilateral relationship. Um, now, um, most of my report uh, is not so much the narrative I've given you. Most of my report is a very detailed analysis of where the opportunities are and how best to pursue them. Um, and I've been deliberately selective. I've chosen 10 sectors where I think Australia has a measure of competitive advantage in this Indian economy where supply and demand aren't going to be in balance. I've, I've described education as the flagship sector of the relationship because I think it's got the single most potential across the economic relationship and because it threads its way through uh, 
so many different areas of the of the relationship um, uh, I've sort of divided the ten into a one flagship three lead and six promising sectors just to sort of keep people awake as they're reading it um, but the the, the promise the, the, the lead sectors are sectors where Australia's got a potential to position itself as in the top say six or so partners of India and that's in resources agribusiness and tourism and then the six sectors are essentially in the services area where the opportunities for Australia will be will be more niche uh, than in the other areas but niche in a market of this size is still very significant um, and then I've, I've sort of aligned that selective choice of sectors by saying don't think of India as a single national economy think of it as an aggregation of different states and different regions each driven by their own dynamics led by different sorts of people uh, different in their in their business friendly outlook different in the way in which they, they approach foreign investment and so I've chosen 10 states where I think it makes sense for uh, Australia to uh, to focus on um, and I've set the sort of macro target over the period between now and 2035 uh, to lift India to our third largest export market. So that would essentially mean trebling our exports to India. Importantly, lifting India to our third largest destination of outward foreign investment in Asia because the Indian <coughs> economic model will be very investment intensive. And what I think we'll see in India is um, a continuing liberalization of foreign investment which will move faster than the liberalization of trade. Uh, in India's instincts are very protectionist when it comes to trade, and I don't see that fundamentally shifting. Uh, but already their foreign investment guidelines and policies are much more open uh, than they've ever been uh, in the past. And so we've got an opportunity with India to do something we haven't been able to do with any other major Asian relationship, and that is to bring trade and investment into some sort of balance uh, and to get a synergy between uh, trade and, uh, and investment. Um, so that's the, short, that's the short version of the, uh, uh, of the report. I very deliberately subtitled it from potential to delivery because India and potential have been bracketed together for um, as long as anyone can remember uh, and it looked for many, many years as if it would remain constantly bracketed together. Uh, I think there is something more fundamental now happening uh, with India's economic trajectory and its economic settings, uh, which means that we do now uh, have an opportunity to shift from thinking about India in terms of potential to thinking about India uh, in terms of delivery. And I think in terms of where our interests are, um, that alignment is, um, is going to play to our benefit if we adopt the right policies, make the right investments, accord the right strategic priority to building this relationship. And that's something which obviously the government has to play a very important role in but it is also essentially a relationship which needs to be built uh, at the business and the people-to-people -people level. Um, so Peter, I might, I might end there. I'm very happy to pick up any questions or comments. Thank you, sir. So Peter, thank you for that um, uh, uh, very succinct um, assessment of um, the situation. Well, what are the, the key policy settings from your perspective that you'd like to see the government undertake to assist the private sector in thinking about India? Yeah. Um, so when, when we were looking at, um, you know, what is it that government should be doing uh, in terms of the business relationship with India, um, you get a lot of advice along the lines of you need an Australia Inc. approach to India. And some of the countries that are doing well uh, in the Indian market, like Japan and Singapore, certainly bring uh, a Japan Inc. and a Singapore Inc. approach, by which I mean uh, 
the government as the central coordinator and almost the director of the relationship in pointing businesses in the right direction and in the right areas. Um, I just don't think that template fits with Australia, our political culture, our economic DNA. And uh, I think for good reason, it doesn't fit uh, with us. Uh, so I don't see uh, the government taking that approach to the business relationship. But what I think the government can do, and I hope will do, uh, is firstly um, make information available to the business community so that they can uh, start thinking about the opportunities in India. Uh, secondly, um, using the agencies of government that already exist, like Austrade and DFAT and others, uh, to help facilitate uh, connections between uh, the business community, uh, provide a framework for the bilateral economic relationship, which may or may not include negotiating in FTA, and I've set out in my report what's the best way to approach the FTA, and that's basically to say we're not going to get there in uh, the, the, the short term because we're too far apart. Let's focus on the RCEP negotiations, which is the, region, the regional negotiations involving ASEAN plus six, and then return to an FTA depending on what we've been able to negotiate in, uh, in, in, the, in the RCEP uh, negotiations, uh, and to make sure that our diplomatic footprint in India is up to the task of dealing with uh, a more serious economic relationship. And I'm very pleased that uh, the government's already picked up one of the recommendations in the report, which is to upgrade our office in Calcutta to a Consulate General, and I hope you know we will, we will look further um, strengthening our diplomatic footprint in, uh, uh, in India. Um, and then I think, you know, the government has a role, I think, also in encouraging the business architecture of the relationship to look a bit differently in the way in which things like the CEO's forum and the business councils operate. And that's more of an encouragement role than a, than a directive role. Well, now, Peter, I'm going to come to the audience in a second, but I do have a couple of other quick questions that I wanted to put to you. Uh, we started with government, but let's flip back now to thinking about a business perspective. Um, what sort of advice would you give to uh, an Australian SME, perhaps more a, a medium than a small enterprise that might be thinking about maybe your six promising sectors in, in your sort of bottom half of the category? I mean, what, what would you be saying to um, a CEO of a company like that that was thinking about, do I dip? my toe into the water of uh, India, or should I perhaps be thinking of uh, other markets? Yeah. Well, I think, I think the first thing would be um, to um, encourage them to take a realistic view about um, the gap that may exist between when you start down the Indian path and when you start um, uh, getting a, uh, a sufficient investment return. So um, I've said in the report that um, Preparation, perseverance, and patience are absolutely crucial to anyone that is attempting to operate in the Indian market, and um, I think that is uh, absolutely the case. Um, I think it's probably wise for a medium-sized enterprise, um, after they've done their preparation and uh, homework, uh, to look very seriously at an Indian partner because this is not uh, an easy system to navigate um, and navigating it with uh, an Indian partner I think can uh, make things uh, that much smoother and certainly many of the success stories uh, of, um, of businesses in India have involved uh, successful business partners but that requires a very large effort of due diligence and, and other things as well. Um, uh, so I think, I think they're, 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 the, you know, they're the sort of key attributes that um, you would want a, a medium-sized business to, to develop. Now, uh, one thing I remember from my time in the Defence Department, I think it was in about um, 2010, I, I came to India as Deputy Secretary mm -hmm. for Strategy when, when you were High Commissioner. and. Um, it hadn't been that long 
since um, effigies of Kevin Rudd were actually being burnt in the streets in New Delhi, uh, which makes me think that <coughs> these Indians aren't uh, silly by uh, any stretch of the imagination. But uh, what, I'm, what I'm really meaning there is that there was certainly a sense of a, a somewhat prickly relationship. And I think part of that had, had to do with um, Australia's reaction to uh, the Indian nuclear test of the uh, late 1990s. But what, what's your assessment of um, how Australia plays in terms of Indian perceptions um, and regard? And does that sense of prickliness um, still hamper or get in the way of um, country to country government-to-government -government relations? Mm. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. Now, I mean, all perceptions of other countries um, suffer from a time lag, and there's no question that the Indian perceptions of Australia are very out of date, um, and all perceptions of other countries inevitably are reduced to generalizations in the way in which you think about other countries. So. India doesn't actually think very much about Australia. Um, their preoccupations are much uh, closer to home. Uh, when they do think about Australia, they tend to think about the sporting relationship. And cricket is a problematic element of the relationship, even while it opens doors. Uh, it sees Australia as a leader in a field like mining. It's beginning to see Australia more and more as a place for education. But beyond that, the list starts wearing uh, quite thin. Now, the, the effigy burning you referred to was in the context of the, the, the huge issue we had with uh, attacks on Indian students, uh, which just dominated the Indian media in a, in a way that's staggering, because most of the Indian media is like Fox News on steroids. I mean, you know, you, if you're exposed to a diet like that for a sustained period, you're going to have a very serious public diplomacy challenge on your, on your hand. But sitting behind that, and this goes back to my point about perceptions being dated, uh, is a willingness on the part of Indians to believe the worst about Australia when it comes to race. Uh, and so the echoes of the old white Australia policy and the colonial legacy and all of that still do uh, reverberate. And even if they don't reverberate sort of front of mind, they're kind of easily recallable when you have a problem um, and, uh, and you want to express the, uh, the problem. So I think there's very little understanding in India about contemporary multicultural Australia, to take just one example. Um, and we both have you know, quite a lot, a lot to do to bring our respective um, impressions of the other up to date. And so I spoke about how Australian business has a dated view of India. Well, I think, you know, on both sides, there's a lot of work that does need to be done. That does need to be done. But, you know, I mean, you could probably pick any relationship that we have, um, and some of that is going to, is going to apply to us. Yes. Um, Last question from me, although I've got so many that I'd like to ask you, but I was intrigued by your uh, uh, observation about how we need to shape and leverage the Indian diaspora in Australia to become a, a sort of an instrument of our economic and people-to-people -people relationship. How do we do that? Um, well, some of it will be done naturally in the sense that I think um, you'll find, particularly when, it, when you're dealing with small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, you're going to find a disproportionate num number of them from diaspora Indians involved in the, in, in, in the relationship. Um, I think um, um, trying to harness the, um, uh, the attributes and the insights that the diaspora community has on say business culture and business dealings uh, is something which um, government agencies can actually reach out and, uh, uh, and, try, and try and absorb. Um, and I think very importantly, using the Indian diaspora to tell a story in India about what contemporary Australia is, 
uh, can be can be very effective because I think I think it, it has an element of conviction to it, uh, which you know this surprises me, which government pronouncements don't um, uh, often. Uh, so I think I think it's 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 that sort of uh, uh, that sort of um, approach. Um, I think the Indian diaspora is likely to prove to be a politically active diaspora. This is my hunch because we're just at the very early stages of it. I think we're more likely to see a Canada-type development with our diaspora. And if, if you follow Canadian politics, the Indian diaspora uh, presence is uh, very significant politically. There, there are more Sikhs in the Canadian cabinet than there are in the Indian cabinet. Um, and uh, I've noticed this already in state governments. When I, when I talk to state premiers and uh, to state government people, they are much, much more focused on the Indian community from a political perspective um, than you get in, in Canberra. And over time, uh, I think we'll see that strengthen. And um, I've got a line in my report which says that over 20 years, the Indian diaspora may prove to be the most politically active diaspora in Australian history since the Irish. So we'll wait and see whether, whether that happens or not. Well, that's a great moment to uh, hand over to the audience. And Doug uh, Key was waving at me early. So, Doug, you get the first question. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I have a hypothetical for you. Uh, uh, here's a mic for you, Doug. Uh, let's suppose that the Indian government commissions you to write a report on the economic and strategic relationship between Australia and India. How would it differ from the one you've just written? What would be the messages that you'd want to convey to an Indian audience uh, to help make the relationship stronger? How, how, how would an Australian strategy for India look giving? And how different would it be for from the strategy in my report? Is that essentially what you're asking? I'm asking what would be your main messages to an Indian audience as you seek to influence India and its view of the relationship with Australia? Yeah. Uh, well, many of the messages would be what's already in the report. So. Um, the, the, the key messages are what does complementarity look like from an Indian perspective? Because um, a lot of the case in my, in my report actually flows from a, an identification of complementary interests or congruent interests. So um, on the economic side, it would be um, saying to um, an Indian audience, that if you want to address this imbalance in supply and demand, which is only going to get sharper as the Indian growth story continues apace, then Australia offers uh, opportunities for you, including, I think, quite significantly investment opportunities. Because uh, if you're if you're going to be uh, looking for resources, or if you're going to be looking for agricultural products or if you're going to be looking for services, um, then building the economic relationship with Australia, investing in Australia, and I think you know, over time we should be thinking about Indian investment in Australia because we will always be a, um, um, a capital intensive economy that can't fund our own capital requirements. I think that would be a key part of the message. Um, I think the strategic congruence message um, in the report uh, fits just as well. If you're looking at it from an Indian perspective, then I think I think there's a growing awareness now in the Indian strategic community that that congruence with Australia is uh, is real. Um, I think um, it's taken quite a long time for uh, for for that to develop. Um, and I, I suspect that um, uh, the role of the Indian diaspora, as outlined in my report, would be pretty similar to the way in which uh, India, looking at the diaspora in Australia, uh, would see it. 
Uh, we don't have um, an Australian diaspora in India of any uh, of any numbers to, to, to be a you know a mirror a mirror asset in that way. I'm not sure if that got to what you were what you were asking. Peter, isn't there a, a sense in some Indian strategic thinking that this new phrase um, Indo-Pacific, which has now been adopted slightly to my surprise by the Americans, uh, is is a bit of a sort of a coded play to try to deal India more into an alliance system, which they're still rather um, reluctant to acquiesce to. Yeah, well, I think um, I think India is happy to be courted uh, strategically, but um, I don't see much prospect at all of India shifting from its position that it's not interested in being anyone's ally. Um, I think the driver of Indian strategic policy is to preserve as much room for manoeuvre as possible, uh, and an alliance is seen as, by definition, restricting your uh, room for manoeuvre. So um, India will, uh, will have a very wide range of strategic partners. I think, I think we should be clear-eyed about that, um, including strategic partners who have views uh, that would not be very congruent with ours uh, or with our, uh, our interests. Um, but I think that room for manoeuvre is, is going to be um, a given in Indian strategic policy, and I don't really see that shifting. I think what has shifted is their willingness to contemplate doing serious things with other countries that stop short of an alliance relationship, but it's nevertheless um, a very important sort of security partnership or strategic, um, or strategic partnership. And you can see that in the way in which um, the Japan-India relationship is, yes. uh, is developing. I think um, Japan has taken a very strategic approach to India uh, and they took it quite early and they um, uh, worked very assiduously at it um, and I think um, out of all of the countries that are dealing with India at the moment I think the Japanese are probably making the most progress uh, with India. Thank you.